Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the FCC's um, ASR program um, workshop on the programmatic environmental assessment that we are undergoing at the moment. Uh, we have a fairly brief uh, slide presentation uh, where we're going to go over basically where we are in the process and, our, and what the process we've been doing involves. Uh, we welcome questions uh, if anybody wants to ask during the meeting, during the presentation, or uh, if there's something that's not covered that you want to discuss, we'll certainly have time afterwards to go over any questions you have. Um, I will ask that when you do have questions, please uh, grab the mic and speak into it. And also uh, raise your hand when you start to speak so the uh, camera people can, can uh, figure out where to point and then introduce your name and uh, your organization. So my name is Aaron Goldschmidt. I'm with the Federal Communications Commission. And uh, very briefly, I want to introduce uh, Jeff Steinberg next to me, who is my boss and also in the, at the FCC. And I will let our consultants, uh, URS, uh, introduce themselves. Uh, they are the scientists who are doing the programmatic environmental assessment for us. Uh, Jeff Reidenauer, I'm the uh, project manager for URS on the uh, contract. Uh, my name's Richard Podolsky. I'm an ecologist with URS. I'm Kathy Baumgartner, and I am a NEPA compliance specialist with URS. I'm Angela Chason, and I'm also a senior NEPA specialist with URS. Okay. Um, very quickly, the agenda. I will briefly state where we are in the PEA process. Uh, then I'm going to turn it over to URS, who's going to be who are going to be conducting most of the meeting, focused on the data sources that we're using uh, or that they're using, the assumptions that are being made, um, the impact analysis, the uh, impact significance, and then the development of alternatives. Very briefly, uh, PEA uh, started with three scoping meetings that were held in December um, in D.C. and San Diego and Tampa. Uh, we have met with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, both the Endangered Species Group and the Migratory Bird Group. Uh, we've also met with the Council on Environmental Quality uh, to discuss uh, where we are in the PEA. Uh, currently, we are preparing a draft PEA. We're hoping to publish that uh, in June of this year, uh, at which time we will have a 30-day public comment period. Um, and after that, some shortly after that, we hope to release the final uh, PEA. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to URS. Jeff? Uh, for, yeah, first, we'd like to talk in general about uh, the uh, data sources that we've used. Uh, so Richard's going to uh, address that topic in detail. And you know, like, like Aaron said, we want this to be interactive. So as we go through each of the slides, please, you know, if you have comments or inputs, please, please share them with us. Kind of in reverse order, I mean, the most valuable literature and uh, sources is the peer-reviewed literature, which is mostly uh, wildlife journals, ornithological journals. Those are, those are the data sources that we rely on the, the most. Um, uh, there's also quite a bit of uh, non-peer-reviewed data that contributes to our understanding of, of uh, the issue. Um, and, and even back as far, I mean, we've known about, you know, tower and lighting has been a known ornithological bird issue, you know, back to literally the Colossus of Rhodes, uh, you know, these fire-lit towers in, uh, in, in the ancient world were, were known to be an issue. So uh, this is no, you know, there's really nothing really new about, uh, about this. There's a history of anecdotal and increasingly more robust scientific studies. When you look at the scientific literature, uh, you really start getting articles uh, focused on um, on the issues at hand 
uh, right around the turn of the last century um, uh, through the 1920s and 30s. Most of it was just kind of, uh, a lot of it was anecdotal information. And increasingly, as we come up to the present time, the studies became more uh, focused on uh, transitioning from, tr uh, from observational science more to experimental science. And in the last year or two, we're starting to get kind of monographs and review articles that really look kind of longitudinally at the issue. So um, right now we have uh, a, a database of around 150 uh, articles that we consider to be particularly important to the matter at hand. Um, at this point, we're focused especially on the direct, uh, the direct impacts, meaning collision, uh, collision issues uh, with dealing with birds. Uh, there's also a literature on indirect effects, and here I'm talking about the possible impact where towers may cause birds to avoid certain habitats um, and, and, and impact them in that way. There's also a, a literature on, uh, mostly from Europe, on uh, radio waves and uh, various radiation that can come from different types of towers. So, uh, but at this point, I think there's a bibliography that we're making available. That one's focused on, this, again, the, the direct impact of uh, collision and mortality. But in the EA, we'll be, covering, um, we'll be covering these indirect effects as well. But they're obviously less, of, less important, but not unimportant. Um, you know, right now, we're, uh, we're doing some due diligence on our, on our bibliography, really determining uh, what's peer-reviewed and what's not peer-reviewed. Right now, when we categorize them, we're being rather rigorous. We, if, unless it's, it has to be an absolutely known peer-reviewed study for us to consider it peer-reviewed. There is a fairly sizable gray literature in this area. And there can, there can be information in there, and there is, that's, that's quite important and useful. But we're, we're finding that uh, it's best for us to rely primarily on the uh, peer-reviewed literature, and there's, a, and there's an ample amount of that. Um, we have some studies that are uh, important studies that are just going under peer review right now. They're listed here. The, um, there's a couple of papers by Longcore et al. Um, from 2011. Um, Gehring uh, is another study that's one of these synthesizing studies <coughs> that we're, you know, that will make it, we're, we're already relying on them. You'll see some of the data that we talk about refers to those, but those are in peer review process. Yeah. Al Manville with the Fish and Wildlife Service. If you're referencing the Gehring, Curlinger, Manville role of tower height and guy wires, that's in press. It's already been peer reviewed. I've got a copy of it here. Great. It's in press now. It hasn't been uh, published yet in Journal of Wildlife Management, but will be this year. Uh, can you share that with that? Uh, we already have. You had requested that document from Joel. Yeah, we have it. We have the manuscript. Yep. So just like that, we'll you know as studies get convert to peer-reviewed literature, we'll be relying on those. And you know, clearly, I mean that that's the gold standard for any conclusions. We want to be relying on. Uh, peer-reviewed science. But as I said, there's a lot of very useful uh, reports. There's, uh, there's been a number of uh, conference proceedings that have been published that I, right now we're considering those gray literature. There's some masters and PhD theses around the country that are also, you know, nicely done studies, but they're in the gray, non-peer-reviewed non status right now. Feedback and information to share at this point on data. Now, in terms of the pro, uh, the program and the the EA, the uh, programmatic EA, the proposed action, uh, just as a reminder, is a revision to the, looking at a revi revisions to the existing program. And the revisions are a revision to a process. Uh, and we're going to talk uh, specifically about the alternatives that we're considering uh, a, bit, a bit later. 
but I wanted to step, uh, step you through our approach uh, prior to talking about the alternatives. Uh, as the, uh, because the impact analysis that we're doing on the existing towers informs our decision making in terms of the alternatives development to a degree. And by that I mean the FCC may revi revise its uh, NEPA compliance process in terms of classifying various categories of projects that are proposed as categorical exclusions or ones that would require site-specific EAs or even EISs if the case uh, warrants. So looking in, into the future, we've made uh, a few assumptions and they're shown on the slide here. Uh, first, uh, in terms of number of towers, we're assuming that under any alternative that's considered, there'll be a similar number of towers that would be uh, proposed. Uh, they're needed in specific areas to provide a service, so that changing the process uh, for the applicant to comply with NEPA wouldn't change the number of towers that would necessarily be proposed. Tower heights, we were assuming that the, the tower heights would be similar under all alternatives because there's there's a need to provide um, coverage for a specific area, so we're assuming that under any scenario, any change to the program, the tower heights would be similar under every alternative. Uh, same with tower locations. FCC isn't going to prohibit a tower necessarily in a specific location, so that we, we're assuming that a change in the process, a change in the NEPA compliance program that FCC would be proposing wouldn't necessarily uh, drive towers out of specific locations. Same with guy wires. And the only real parameter or variable that changes is, is, is lighting. And that's driven by the FCC uh, change in their circular. You mean FAA? I'm sorry, <laughs> FAA, I'm sorry, thanks, Aaron. FAA. Comments? I'm sure this would generate a few. Good. All right. Well, since we're in polite mode today, uh, I'm Bill Sill with Wilkins and Barker now, and representing the Infrastructure Coalition. And in looking at the assumptions, uh, the first question I had is, um, are you considering the effect that um, co-locations would have on decreasing the number of new towers that would have to be built? Um, well, certainly, and, and we'll talk a little bit um, in a few slides from now about our assumptions regarding the number of new towers that are going to be built and um, yes certainly co-locations is part of the um, is, is part of the universe of considerations there I think what we what we're saying here is that that's not likely to be affected significantly by where we come out in the EA that we're, we're sort of assuming that where people can co-locate they're going to do it anyway because there are plenty of other powerful reasons to co-locate. There may be some effects at the margin, but basically um, the changes in our rules we think are not likely to have a major effect on how many co-locations versus new towers there are going to be. Just as, just as a follow-up, um, let's for the moment assume that there are a wide ar array of, of different potential um, alternatives. And in some of the alternatives, siting is more difficult than others because more areas are ruled out. Um, are you saying that under all the, under all the, even under the most um, uh, constrictive uh, alternative from a tower siting standpoint, that you think that that wouldn't, you're assuming that that wouldn't have an effect on the number of towers that could be built? Yeah, I think we're, we're under the under the most restrictive that we could reasonably consider and we're throwing out certain alternatives such as you know you can't build any more towers um, but um, that I guess our assumption is there's not likely to be a really big effect on the number of towers that are built um, we may be wrong on that what you know that's part of the purpose of this workshop is we lay out where we are and you know we'll take information you know either now or in follow-up that you know we absolutely welcome information that will allow us to do these things on a more scientific and more data-based um, basis than we may be at right now I think also yeah, on the co-locations we're, we're assuming that generally speaking tower companies co-locate whenever possible right now so we don't expect a change in our rules to really drive that further uh, to result in more co-locations instead of towers being built right now. And again, if that's not industry's 
position, please feel free to present and suggest otherwise. But that's been our, one of the assumptions that we're working under. Hi, I'm uh, Darren Schrader with American Bird Conservancy. Can you raise your hand real briefly? Oh, I'm so sorry. Just see who. <laughs> Cameras. Yeah. Um, I guess my question to you, Jeffrey, was something you said about locations. Uh, you said that under these processes, you couldn't foresee ruling out certain locations uh, for four towers. Is that correct? You, well, that there would be no yes. locations that would preclude a tower? Right. I mean, we look at, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but certainly, you know, locations in a, a, a an endangered species critical habitat, you know, that's, that's important. FCC, that, correct me if I'm wrong, they can't prohibit a building of a tower in any specific location. Um, I don't know if we couldn't prohibit. Um, certainly the way, the way we have gone about this and, and I think the way we are oriented towards continuing to structure our regulations is that certain locations would trigger an EA requirement. Um, if the EA cannot reach a FONSI, then it would trigger an EIS requirement. I think in, as a practical matter, in most cases, if, it got, if it got, something got to the EIS stage, we would have the authority to say, you know, no, this, you know, this tower doesn't outweigh the environmental damage. We either won't do the EIS or we go through the EIS and eventually um, it, it um, you know, it may come out to the build or not build or build with certain conditions. Um, I think in most cases the industry, if something got to the EIS stage, would say, you know, this one just isn't worth it. Um, but um, so I think that's the way we're certainly very much oriented to keeping our regulation structured rather than having something in the regulations that says, you know, these areas are absolutely out of bounds under all circumstances because I'm not sure we can judge in advance. Um, I, I think, again, in terms of effects on locations, what we're thinking is, you know, at least to, if, you, if you're talking about broad areas, you generally don't have an awful lot of flexibility from the communication standpoint about where you built the tower. We may be able to, through our, um, you know, through our rules, certainly, if there's a sensitive location that isn't already identified in our rules, and many of them are, um, you know, it might be over here instead of over here. But it's not. We're not likely to be able to reach the, uh, you know, put it over on the other side of the room there. Alameda the Fish and Wildlife Service. I guess I could address this both to the consultants and to the FCC. Have you and your NEPA review process considered the new Eagle take rules, particularly 2226 for disturbance take? Because that is a locational issue. Our current draft guidelines, which are under public review in the Federal Register, the draft Eagle Conservation Plan guidance, this module is focused on wind development. but. We're talking about developing other modules for other issues, perhaps even for communication towers. And while our guidelines currently are voluntary, the take of golden and bald eagles is not voluntary. That's a criminal liability issue that needs to be addressed. And I guess I would raise the question, what kind of um, placement issues are you considering? We've got a category one issue in our eagle conservation guidance that basically says this is a red zone. This is an area you should avoid um, building because of potential either take resulting in disturbance or take resulting in mortality. Uh, I'll start off first. We had the meeting with you a few weeks back and we did, we did talk about that and we certainly are considering that as we're, we're preparing the EA in terms of of, um, of um, more specifics with that. I'll have, unless Richard, you want to um, contribute. We, we are considering, the, we recognize that you, you mentioned that the a few weeks ago at our meeting, so we are considering that. And, and the issue with, with bald eagles, um, we're considering individual take permits for, for bald eagles. However, for golden eagles, because of the current status of the population, which appears to be in decline, we're going to only be issuing permits west of the 100th meridian, and these will very likely be programmatic permits. So um, that creates a, a bit of a different paradigm here. Um, and I would just suggest we need to continue in 
close discussions and dialogue between you folks, FCC, and us, and, and moving forward on this. Question. More questions on this slide? Yeah. Uh, quick question. If a programmatic EIS was warranted, would you foresee that including an, a consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service, a requirement that a consultation take place? I'm sorry, are you talking about a programmatic consultation or are you talking about individual tower? Individual tower. Would we consider requiring consultation with Fish and Wildlife in all instances if we end up take, doing a PEIS? That's right. I, I think the question is a little premature. Uh, we're not at that stage right now. Right. right a question. Um, we actually have two of them. Okay, two of them from from the folks listening online. Um, Rachel Rice of the Technology Law and Policy Clinic at the University of Colorado Law School says, you mentioned that you are also considering data from non-peer-reviewed sources. Could you please specify who or what these sources are? The quick answer to that is if you go to the PEA website right now, we have um, a bibliography on that page. It's linked to the April 1st meeting, and you can click on that and download and see all the uh, you can get a, a copy of, of the bibliography that lists all the items identified as either peer-reviewed or non-peer-reviewed, uh, so you can see which, which non-peer-reviewed items we're currently considering. Um, another one from someone who's not identified. Um, we do request that those of you who are um, sending in questions online, um, please do identify yourself, just for the record. Um, it says, some observers have noted that your internal procedure regarding the EAs essentially allows the registrants to perform their own EA. Given this impression, can you explain exactly how something might reach the EIS stage? Um, well, we do review the EAs when they come in, and um, if the, you know, if we have to issue the FONSI, that's not issued by the, the applicant who prepares the EA. So if, if, you know, if, if the evidence did not support a FONSI, then it would move on to an EIS stage, or if the applicant themselves in performing the work um, determines that, that the EA wouldn't support a FONSI, they would have to come to us for an EIS. I guess we'll move on to the next slide now. circular status uh, our understanding is that the study has been completed and is currently under review um, the FAA is determining how to implement that study and its findings uh, the FCC has been coordinating with the FAA and at this time we don't have a clear understanding of the of the timetable for implementation of uh, the results of that study so that that's an important driver I think as we all recognize in, in this in this process as I I mentioned uh, lighting is one of the one of the variables, one of the factors that, you know, or, or maybe the key factor in the, you know, driving uh, some of the results of this. So, um, I know Al had mentioned uh, he had some discussions with FAA. Maybe you could share those or. Yeah, I just had a uh, email communication with one of my FAA contacts this morning, and as you indicate, um, they're not yet ready to finalize this report. They're not clear on exactly when the time frame for this to happen, so unfortunately it's not going to likely coincide with the NEPA review process, but they will advise FCC and us, Fish and Wildlife Service, as soon as that report is um, ready for distribution, finalized, basically. Thanks. This is Jameer Goldman. I'm counsel for environmental groups. Has the FCC considered uh, communicating with the FAA at the highest levels to try to impress upon the FAA the need to move this forward? We are considering that, yes. Um, at this point, we're working at, um, you know, at the staff level with them, and, and we're very much in touch with each other. I think we're likely to have a meeting with them scheduled for later this month to, to discuss where things are in, in more detail. Um, but yes, we are also um, 
working things internally and, and discussing. Kind of an overview of our uh, approach to the impact analysis. We're, we're uh, characterizing the current conditions, and uh, there's already an existing, as we know, tower. Um, there's a built environment out there already. Uh, existing towers are out there. Existing towers are being constructed now. And uh, what we've done is basically characterize the uh, the current number of structures uh, using the uh, SCC's ASR database. We've looked at the various height categories of the, of the structures, uh, the geographical distribution of the towers. And then from that, we're, we're looking in terms of uh, uh, future conditions from which to project uh, possible uh, future impacts. So we've taken, we've taken the current number of structures and projected out into the future um, what we expect or would reasonably expect the number of towers to be in the future, and then uh, uh, using that projected future bird mortality. And uh, the next step after that is taking a look at the cumulative impacts, taking into consideration uh, all things that may may impact birds. Yes, Greer. This is Greer Bolton again. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you are projecting future trends? because? Uh, with the broadband build out and other pressures to increase the numbers of towers, we we're concerned that you use the reasonable and figures for th the future. I appreciate that. And that's, uh, we're going to do that just in a couple slides, but, uh, and, and, and certainly that, that's a point at which we were expecting, you know, some interaction and some feedback from, from, from everybody because we've taken uh, an estimate and we'll get into that in just a few slides. Uh, this, uh, this graph just shows uh, a breakdown of the uh, height distribution of tower towers registered by year. And what we did was uh, we kind of consolidated some of the uh, earlier years uh, worth of uh, tower data to the left on the graph and, and they look, looked at the uh, various height categories, basically under 200 feet and then in 50 foot increments up to about um, 1,000 foot and 1,000 foot to 1,500 and 1,500 to 2,000. And what you can see from this graph is that around 2000, 2001, there was a kind of a, a spike in the number of towers that were constructed and it kind of tailed off in the last, uh, last seven, eight years. So, Bill. I just had a really good question on the chart. The 2011 um, um, lip. Um, looks very yeah. tiny. When was this uh, oh, table actually oh, yes, done as well? Uh, well, th this represents data that we pulled from the database in early February. So this will this will be updated as we as we move forward. So so basically, it would be just January uh, data. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, if you look at from two thousand and two, you know it's been averaging right around 3,000 towers over the last, you know, roughly 10 years, new towers per year, whereas the decade before, you know, was ramping up and maybe was averaged around the same, actually. That's... Don't press it until they. <laughs> my apologies. Um, this table is, is basically a summary of the, the previous graph, um, looking at the, the various tower heights, and then the, the column next to that in the middle shows the uh, a breakdown of the, uh, the percentage of the towers at the various height categories, and then uh, the, the uh, column to the right shows the, ba the, base, uh, the last five years worth of data. 
And the message here is, uh, the story here is that um, overall in the database, 30, a little over 35% of the towers are under 200 feet. And then the last five years, they're about 46% uh, or so are under 200 feet. And um, Apologies, we apparently missed something in the middle here. Something got lost. Um, but in terms of the uh, large towers, uh, over 500 feet, less than 10% in the database are, are, are over 500 feet. Give us a revised chart. Right there, yes. Thank you. There's a 300 to 350 missing. Yeah, there's a list here of missing 300 to 350, although the numbers look like they add up to roughly 100%, so I, I can't I tell split whether it's... out something wrong. Yeah, that's what it looks like. We'll correct that. So for, for whatever reason, and probably people in the room who know, there's the, the trend is towards uh, the, 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 the new towers being constructed are uh, trending towards the shorter towers, which we'll get into a little bit later is generally a, a good thing. And probably because of the cell phone industry, they don't need quite the height that broadcast. Maybe folks here you know, know from a technical reason why that would be the case. But uh, We have all the uh, tower uh, information in a GIS and we can query the, uh, the database in terms of uh, geographical distribution of the towers. And we've been doing that as we move forward with our, our evaluation. And a couple, couple patterns have emerged. Uh, towers are primarily in the eastern two-thirds of the U.S. And I think this is pretty general information that most everybody probably knows. But primarily in the eastern two-thirds of the nation. And then the greatest concentration of towers is uh, in the south, southeast, midwest, and around the Great Lakes. Um, on that on that slide, is that uh, is that quantifiable? In other words, could could you pull out you know what what percentage when you said primarily? I was just wondering if there's a quantification. Yeah, uh, you know, the distributions by states and, and regions, we can certainly you know quantify that. Yep. Yeah. All right. This slide uh, number ten shows the. Uh, our future estimates of, of uh, towers out five years and ten years, and our our assumptions, our working assumption with the development of this data is that we just you know used historical trends to develop this, yeah. and this represents the total number of towers that would be uh, be in the environment. Yeah, I do. I do want to emphasize that this is a you know a working assumption of where we are at this point in the process, and you know, well, well, we'll go on to the next slide and talk more about other things that will weigh into that. So the graph basically reflects our projections using uh, the 2009-2010, those two-year average number of, of towers. Um, and of course, this is subject to change, as we mentioned, based on uh, ongoing analysis and, and input, frankly, from, from you all at this point. So. Right, um, and just, just to give a little flavor of the you know, of the and and they're both things that both Bill and Greer have have brought up already. Um, you know, among the things to consider are, you know, as the build out continues, are are more things going to be able to be done by co-locations rather than new towers that that would reduce numbers. Um, trends towards shorter towers would reduce um, both effects and potentially reduce the numbers that need to go into the ASR database since. Um, while there are a lot of two towers under 200 feet in the database now, most of the towers under 200 feet don't actually need to be there. Um, and they're not really what we're focused on in, in this analysis. Um, um, 
On the other hand, you know, as Greer mentioned, there are, you know, build outs for new services. I think that, um, again, a lot of what, what that will need, um, our understanding is can be co-locations will be done with much shorter types of facilities um, you know another factor to take into consideration is build out of public safety services which we're getting our arms around as well but they that you they are in a build phase um, because of grant programs that have been authorized and other things and they tend to require somewhat taller towers than the commercial towers so that that's a factor to consider on that side um, I think the, the general sense that we have gotten from a lot of analyst estimates is that at least for the commercial services um, that the likelihood is that the, that the number of new builds um, subject to ASR is going to be ramping down. Um, we want it to, you know, to take that into account. At this point, we're not yet able to quantify it, so we have not put it into these charts. We, we don't have specific information on it. but. You know, we're working towards the ability to quantify, and again, we really, really welcome any help we can get because it is, it is a difficult thing. Um, obviously, it's projections. All projections are estimates. But um, without, you know, without something to base it on, it's, it's hard to, to do anything other than just predict straight line growth. Along those lines, I, I, I agree with you that there are a lot of factors of to play into that, and I was just wondering, have, have you um, considered the effect of um, more restrictive uh, local zoning um, uh, regulations and also opposition uh, that we get at the local zoning level as, a, as kind of a um, dampening effect on new builds and dampening effect on taller, the builds of taller towers? Certainly that's another factor to consider. Again, I think you would want to consider it in the context of change. I mean, there have always been local zoning ordinances and always been local opposition. I think un unless it's, unless that's something that we can project will, will be greater in the future, um, then I, I'm not sure how much it's a factor. On the other hand, it may be because of actions the FCC is taking on other fronts that, um, you know, one could argue that there'll be less of, a, um, of an obstacle. ask uh, with whom you're consulting to try to get a good better handle on these future projections um, we're I mean we're doing a lot of this internally with our own folks who are um, more up-to-date looking at um, publicly available databases um, they we've done some talk with um, you know had had some conversations with investment analysts who do make it their business to try to project these things because they affect the um, the company's fortunes. Um, not all of that is, you know, much of that is not information they want to make available to the public because um, you know, they they want to make money off of giving advice to their own clients. But um, so we have to figure out the best ways to work with that. But but sometimes they are willing to share with us on a confidential basis some of their their internal information, and we can try to work with that. Um, and, and massage it into something that, that we could make publicly available. I'm curious about your statement that you think there'll be fewer towers, uh, if I heard you correctly, uh, because of the push to increase uh, coverage in rural areas where there isn't currently service. There, there will certainly be built out in the rural areas um, and and new towers coming out of that. Um, again, it's 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 largely a matter of how the different factors offset each other. And I certainly the sense that we've gotten um, from some of the discussions we've been having with analysts and others is that um, is that there's likely to be significantly less build of taller towers dis despite. Um, you know, s some of the rural build out. And again, it, it, it's, it's to some extent a guess of how much the rural is going to be, and this is preliminary. It may not, um, you know, when we ultimately, when we get through everything, we, we may not have that declining break. We certainly haven't put it into our estimates yet. Um, but um, 
it's, it's just a, a, an initial sense of where we are right now. We have s several slides to look at um, kind of more of the ornithology side. Uh, it's, it's, it's well known and it's been known for a long time, both from the peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed literature that, you know, taller towers are, take more birds than lower towers. Towers that have uh, guy wires are more aggressive in the landscape and take more birds. Uh, steady lights are, you know, we now uh, have good science to indicate that, uh, you know, steady lights are, are more of a problem than flashing lights, which allow more birds to pass. So. Uh, some of the slides we want to talk about here, we're trying to do a number of things. We're trying to just show uh, some of the structure of what's going on. This first slide, uh, we're looking at uh, estimation of annual mortality based on tower height. Um, the blue are our peer-reviewed studies. The red are not peer-reviewed. And, um, and then we also make a distinction where if we know whether or not the tower had guy wires or not. It's not always, all of the studies don't, did not always record that. So it's, in some cases, it's unknown whether or not they had guy wires. But we have a slide coming up that um, will look at the guy wire issue, which is an important one. Um, you know, the thing to realize about these data is that um, I describe it as opportunistic. These studies, this is not the result of a longitudinal study where, uh, you know, we sampled totally randomly across the country in different regions, different kinds of towers. So it, it's not really a robust study. I call it opportunistic in that we've gone to the peer-reviewed literature and we've taken a, a good hard look at, uh, at the data and, and ar arrayed it. Um, but it's important to realize that. For example, you'll notice there's a big gap between 500 feet and 1,000 feet. For whatever reason, the, the published and unpublished studies of, you know, focused on a fair bit on the smaller towers and these medium height, they just don't exist, so we don't really know. But presumably we can, you know, fill in, the, the trend probably would fill in, fit in there somewhere. Uh, but it's important to realize that there are some gaps in this data. We're adding to this data all the time, or at least trying to by, uh, there's some studies where they pool tower data and we can't really include those. We may, certainly in our final analysis, we'll have uh, we should have more data to look at here. What I want to do with the next slide is if you look at the, the section of this slide from zero to 500 feet, we're just going to focus and the next slide we just take a look at, at just those and you can see kind of the trend there. Again, um, mortality and impact on birds really ramps up as towers get higher, as they get higher, even between, you know, zero and 600 feet. Um, most birds migrate fairly high. Uh, probably most birds migrate over a thousand feet on normal conditions. Um, so what we're really looking at in terms of avian impacts is from towers uh, are the birds on the lower end of their height migration. Uh, so as you get, as towers get higher, they start to penetrate into higher uh, density uh, passage areas, uh, and that's why we get increase in um, w in mortality with tower height. Bruce, yes. Let me let me caveat your statement here. When you say most birds migrate uh, at thousand feet or higher, that's just not simply correct. Neotropical migratory songbirds do, but they have to take off and land when they have inclement weather events, which are our major areas of concern. That puts them at risk, particularly when fallout occurs and they come down and are attracted to the lights and strike the guy wires. So we have to be very careful. These kind of generalizations don't help the picture. There are also many other species that migrate very close to ground level that also are impacted by collisions with communication towers and their guy wires. So um, we have to be, again, very, very careful in how we generalize this because that's uh, a statement that's commonly misinterpreted and misrepresented. Fair enough. I absolutely agree with everything you said, Al. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, here's where we're looking at, uh, you know, basically, I mean, 
you know, the more structure that's out there, either more mass, taller towers, bigger towers, and the bigger the towers, you know, the more support they need, more guy wire. So you're really tall towers have more guy wire sets and there's they just you know present an increasing uh, risk of collision the more you know the, the, the taller the tower gets and um, the trend in this graph we're, we're looking at guy wire sets here and this is um, uh, from the subset of our peer-reviewed studies that we had guy wire data uh, we don't really know what uh, from the literature, we don't know what a guy wire set is, but if you've been around communication towers, they're either uh, a set is either a pair, two, two wires, it can be three wires, it can be four wires to a set. And that's not really broken out. A better look at this data would be total number of guy wires. It would probably have a, a little better trend, but it, the, it's a positive correlation. The more guy wire sets means more guy wires, and that just means more co potential for collision. Um, Richard, I gather we haven't done analysis to figure out how much this, um, you know, the guy wire sets is simply correlated to height or is, because, I mean, they're obviously they're interacting factors. They're totally interacting factors. Uh, you know, taller towers have more guy wires. They need more support. So they, they, it's impossible to really, you can't, we don't have data from tall towers with no guy wires because there is no such thing. But, Just the lighting alone, um, you know, if, if we just, uh, and again, that's what was mentioned, it's, uh, that's an FAA decision, but in terms of low-hanging fruit on alternatives analysis, um, here we've made an attempt, at taking from the literature, um, the, ch the, the possibility that there could be as much as a 70% reduction in avian kills from uh, changing the lighting regime. Um, another estimate is that it could be as much as 50 percent. And uh, of course we have to superimpose that on the build out which we were just discussing. We don't really know. We have a rough sense using recent history how many new towers will be built. But if all new towers were to be uh, outfitted with uh, what the science shows to be um, lower impact to birds, uh, this is a possible outcome from off of the uh, off of the uh, uh, no act the no action meaning uh, continuing with the the current uh, build out. Sorry, just just one quick question: Is this chart looking at just the direct impacts, not direct and indirect? This is just collision. This is this is just addressing mortality from collision. Thank you. Uh, if I also just want to um, elaborate on one of the notes in the box here, um, these numbers also are, uh, the, the lower trend lines are assuming that, um, that FAA off authorizes the changes in lighting and that all future towers will go forward with the reduced lighting. Um, this does not take into account um, tower owners changing the lighting on existing towers, turning off steady lights that are there, or converting them to flashing, which would, of course, make the trend lines much lower. Potentially. This is uh, our attempt to put, you know, kind of the, the context of cumulative impacts, like w what are all the various um, anthropogenic uh, factors that are out there in the, in the landscape right now uh, that are impacting birds and um, clearly shows, uh, you know, puts in context uh, <laughs> where uh, communication towers fall in the bigger picture. Yes. We, and Richard, I appreciate your effort to try to characterize this. Um, I was a peer reviewer of Ericsson et al. 2001, and this is basically a 
repetition of that in the Partners in Flight document. Two papers that I've published that are peer review you haven't referenced in your literature citation that I've attempted to update, including the proceedings from Partners in Flight 2009 with some of the more current estimates. So I would bring this up if you want to reflect uh, best estimates or best guesstimates, however you want to characterize this, of mortality. Looks like cats are taking the number one spot now, followed by building windows. We think over a billion cats based on uh, the current uh, number of articles in the Wildlife Professional Journal that just came out last week yes. um, is very telling. Um, the yeah, I, I, I did, and I included it, but I'll resend the, these are both peer-reviewed documents uh, in Partners in Flight proceedings, so. And we have some briefing papers as well that are available to the public that we could provide you with some updated statistics. I'll be glad to do that. We, we've, uh, I just want to wait, we just started basically have started taking a harder look at cumulative impacts at this point. We haven't proceeded too far down the road with cumulative at this point. Basically, I've been focusing on, on the impacts of the program, changes of the program right now. So we're just uh, basically introducing some, some of our thoughts and some of our uh, uh, general uh, approaches to this, this topic at this point in time. So. Jeff, let me just mention, too, that this, these kind of data are often used to try to take the focus off of an issue and say, well, you know, the number of birds killed by, estimated killed by communication towers, four to five million compared to over a billion cats, therefore it's not a problem. The problem, however, is that doesn't get to the heart and meat of the issue, and that is we have over 42 birds of conservation concern, several federally listed species, candidate species, and others in the Long Corps et al. papers that I'm a co-author on that document in detail impacts at a population level to some of these species. That's the crux of the issue. So what can we do to reverse that? And of course, the lighting issues are, um, we think, a very important component of that. Our, our, the reason, this is just there because it nicely frames the cumulative impact, but not in any way to uh, draw attention away. But um. yeah, I think in the next slide, uh, we, we do bring up uh, some of the other issues. In, just like you mentioned, Al, some of the you know, population or species-specific impacts are an important consideration, not just overall birds. So that's that's something that need, would need to you know, be included and addressed. And then, you know, in terms of cumulative impacts, we look at past, present, and reasonably foreseeable projects, not only towers but other 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 projects that affect birds. And also, uh, looking look, we would try to put into context other factors that it, uh, affect birds, you know, climate change being one and, and other things like that, other natural natural factors we at least address now, the document. This is probably beyond the purview of this NEPA analysis, but are you going to look at radiation issues at all or is that just not part of this? No, we, we, we discussed that a few weeks back at our meeting and certainly that's something that we'll We'll, you know, we'll we'll address, but uh, frankly, I don't think you know. There's a there's a very robust literature out there to uh, to support and help me out, Richard yeah. here. But um, you know, well, other than Litovich's study here in, in the lab uh, on chicken embryos, we've done nothing in North America, to my knowledge, yet. But there's a fair database, Balmori, Bowens, et al., Everhart over in Europe that is raising some concerns, and we're trying to get some funding to replicate studies here in in the U.S. And, and North America, Canada, and Mexico, for that matter, to, to try to see if we can tease out what's actually going on here. It's, uh, we have we have a not even a placeholder. We have uh, we've already reviewed those studies. We'll, they'll be they'll be discussed along with some of the indirect impacts of towers. You know, uh, dealing with some of the gal you know uh, gallinaceous grouse and uh, prairie chicken issues in the West, where you know so. Those are, you know, th there's, uh, those will be discussed in the, in the final document yeah, along I'm with assuming you're going to include the eagle issues with, with uh, fragmentation disturbance with the new definition of disturb. You've got where um, they abandon a nest or where viability is affected or breeding is, is interrupted or whatever. These are all disturbance take issues that need to be considered in them. And again, if you're unclear that the our draft eagle guidelines guidance goes into those details considerably and we also reference it in, in our draft wind turbine guidelines that talk about the issues so
We have a um, question submitted online from um, Bill Evans at TowerHill.com. Um, will there be any consideration of how a programmatic change in FCC regulations might set a precedent for Canadian and Mexican broadcast and communications tower policies, potentially leading to further reduction in collision impacts to North American mi night migrating songbirds? In other words, a change in FCC policy may indirectly lead to larger population conservation impacts for migratory birds crossing the U.S than is estimated by just looking at U.S. tower numbers. Um, I think, frankly, we had not given much consideration to that. I think it's, um, the point is well taken. It's something I don't know if it's going to, it, it may be too speculative to, to really be a, a major factor in our analysis, but it, it's something we'll give thought to as we go forward. Thank you. Jeff, I just might mention that we have uh, discussions beginning with the Japanese and the Russians in our migratory bird treaty um, issues with them. In fact, my boss is over in Moscow now for meetings. I prepared some PowerPoint uh, slides addressing these issues. We're in discussions at the trilateral. We'll begin to uh, we'll have that meeting again in May with our colleagues from Canada and Mexico. We are collaborating on these issues, and hopefully, when you folks move forward on this. Um, We'll be able to transition and get uh, our colleagues in Canada uh, um, and, and Mexico engaged as well. So, um, again, there's not a whole lot we can do right now based until you make a determination on what's going on, but, but we are advising them of, of the issues and what we know about impacts and so on. Yes, Bill. The consideration of indirect impacts um, in in your in the URS's work, and I was just wondering, could you flesh out a little bit for us um, what indirect impacts? Uh, could you describe them? Uh, what types you're looking at? Sure. Um, you know, any any uh, impact where uh, let's say otherwise suitable habitat for birds would be. Uh, unused or abandoned because of simply the presence of a tower. Um, the best example of that right now are uh, uh, prairie chickens, lesser and greater prairie chickens out west, uh, uh, greater sage grouse, some of these uh, you know, uh, gallinaceous uh, birds primarily in the west, uh, you know, they very uh, uh, wary of uh, any potential perches for uh, birds of prey, including towers or buildings. They also appear to be uh, very sensitive to um, roads and construction. So, uh, you know, th there are examples where birds will just uh, abandon areas uh, simply because of the presence of various types of uh, built structures, uh, buildings. Um, and in, in some cases tower. So that, that's an example of an indirect effect where otherwise suitable habitat would be uh, uh, used less because of a uh, presence of a tower. So at this point, we have, uh, we have some broad uh, conclusions that, that we've, we, we've reached and are uh, uh, continuing to drill down on uh, more specifics, but at this time, and some of these, uh, I believe, are probably pretty obvious and known at this point, uh, but you know, birds are killed by collisions with communication towers, all other factors being equal, and we've discussed this in the previous slides, taller towers result in higher bird mortality than shorter towers. Um, towers with guy wires result in higher bird mortality than unguide towers. And all other factors being equal, steady burning lights on towers result in higher bird mortality than uh, flashing lights. And that towers uh, contribute incrementally to the overall bird mortality when considering uh, looking at cumulative impacts. And as some of our previous slides have shown, you know, we're trying to get um, a better understanding of, of in terms of, you know, which heights uh, trigger, you know, uh, 
bird kills at what what uh, what level. So, but those are you know the uh, broad conclusions that we reached at this point. And we'd like to uh, touch on the uh, alternative uh, alternatives. You know, as I mentioned, the impact analysis that we've been conducting is basically uh, being utilized to inform uh, the the alternatives and the the, the proposed action is uh, is a revision to the program. So a revision to the the NEPA compliance process is what's uh, what the proposed action would be. So uh, Angela is going to be a uh, you know, speaking to the next couple slides. So. Um, beginning with the no action alternative, again, that's assuming that the program is going to continue to operate and will operate under the interim procedures um, that FCC has outlined. Um, the proposed action, as Jeff mentioned, is revisions to the program. Just ask for, uh, explain what MOU you were referring to. That's the MOU. Threshold is the um, that, that's, the, that's the, the quick summary of the main thing that's relevant here. Sure. If I could just add also point of information on the, um, the public notice that went out last week on um, the FCC rules, um, we are anticipating that those will be published in Federal Register next Tuesday. That's what we've been told. So, um, so that would start the 30-day comment period. Go ahead. Um, under the proposed action, we're looking at um, two options, uh, the first being um, an EA or an EIS, depending on uh, the level, the, the anticipated impact, is required for all tower applications. Option B is that an EA or EIS would be required for some proposed towers, and factors that could um, indicate an EA under that option would be tower height, and we're not at this point we're not looking at a direct cutoff of a certain amount of feet we're probably going to be looking more at a range of height um, and we, we haven't determined that yet that's something that we're still looking at um, also location in an environmentally sensitive area and you can see the footnote there that uh, that includes uh, teeny habitat coastal zone wetlands riparian zone floodplains or ridge lines um, we considered putting the migratory flyways in that list, but because it's so difficult to pin down the boundaries of those, you know, an applicant really would not be able to say, I'm in, I'm out. Um, it would be difficult to determine that. So we, we decided to look at things like coastal zones, um, riparian zones, um, ridge lines, uh, things that are more easily measured and uh, where you can draw a line, a better line than you can with the, the migratory flyways. The, the, the flyways, uh, for the record, are administrative designations. The, the, the ducks, the geese, the swans kind of ignore them. So, right. uh, and that's only a small part of the picture we've got uh, with songbirds, broad front migrations, the work by Sid Gotro and Carol Belzer and others, certainly shown these explosive, which uh, from the Rocky Mountains to the eastern shore, right. um, occurring during uh, migration. So that kind of confounds the whole issue. Sure. One of the reasons I mentioned, though, the flyways is that that's been something that's been brought up in our scoping meetings, um, you know, public um, interest, in other words. Um, the other thing that is not um, included here that we are looking at in the programmatic EA is um, rookeries, uh, known uh, stopover points where, where birds rest. Um, those are the kind of things we're looking at as well as far as being an environmentally sensitive area you know, as far as the information that's available on where those areas are, and there is a lot of, of literature that points to those. Um, the other factors that we're looking at are whether a tower uses guy wires and um, whether they use steady burning lights. And again, that is dependent on the FAA circular. Um, we, we can only address um, the lighting issue as it currently stands. We, we, um, we are looking at um, we know what the what the new circular pretty much would say, but we can only under NEPA we can only address the the condition that that is currently um, enforced. 
Any comments or discussion? Uh, since so much concern, uh, of the impacts are created under the current system with the current towers in place and there's nothing here that relates to existing towers, uh, have you considered whether there are any options for existing towers such as uh, incentives or at the time of, re of license renewal uh, requiring any changes? Well, first of all, I think that from a practical, um, technical, and economic feasibility standpoint, um, about the only thing you could really possibly consider that I'm, I'm happy to take other suggestions, but um, on existing towers is probably lighting. Um, I think anything else is um, I, 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 probably not even you know anything that could be on the table. Um, in terms of lighting, um, we're, we're considering whether there may be options in that area in terms of our um, you know ability to take some action we would certainly want anything that we do first of all would depend on what the FAA does um, 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 depending upon FAA action um, it may also depend on what FAA does with its own procedures how easy it is to change lighting on existing towers um, you know beyond that we, we have questions of our own authority that we are considering, and we have questions um, on, you know, we would want to take a very serious look at, um, at what is economically feasible, um, you know, before putting in mandatory, um, you know, anything mandatory on existing towers. But it's, um, at having said that, it's all very definitely part of the mix. It is something that we're looking at seriously as, as, as we consider where we are to, to think about addressing, you know, if there is something feasible, um, which there may very well be, to do about existing towers in the, in the lighting sense, then, then we do want to take it into consideration. Uh, we would just urge you to uh, continue down that road and not be uh, um, concerned in the first instance about economic feasibility because uh, sometimes uh, there can be uh, overestimates of the uh, cost of changes and and if pressed perhaps industry can come up with some in, uh, ways to make changes that are uh, not so as costly as they might be point well taken and Jeff I would also suggest and we recommend this in our current uh, voluntary communication tower guidelines our voluntary wind turbine guidelines and our uh, voluntary power line guidance that even though you don't necessarily have authority on the infrastructure related to the towers you suggest strongly as we've been trying to do to use uh, lighting that does not stay on all night but rather is either motion or or uh, heat sensitive so that it only illuminates when it's needed and uh, as work that my colleague Bill Evans and others have done determined that even at short towers when we have these uh, ancillary lights that are on all night we've had some fairly large mortality events bordering on a mass mortality event from from attraction to the lighting so if, if you can make that recommendation even though you may not have authority that would I think move things forward very positively and, and help the issue okay considered and dismissed and uh, underneath an alternative that's considered and dismissed is one that is not it's either not feasible or it doesn't meet the purpose and need for the project um, so the ones that that we have looked at but have decided that they aren't feasible is to prohibit all new tower construction um, you know not allow any more towers to be built um, also prohibiting towers that exceed a certain height um, that's not realistic in, in meeting the, the need for, for communications. Um, prohibiting towers from certain locations. Um, again, we are addressing that with um, looking at the environmentally sensitive areas that I mentioned before. Um, you know, prohibiting guy wires. Again, that's a structural issue for towers that are a certain height. Um, it, my understanding is that it's not feasible to, to build them to that height unless you have the support of guy wires. And that, that I'm 
just going to debate that point for a minute. We have a tower here at Catholic University that's a lattice tower, 750 feet in height, here in D.C. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it's it's all about the cost of steel. The more lattice structure, the more it's going to cost the the proponent to put that tower up. We acknowledge that, but and there are wind loading issues with hurricanes and whatever. But we're suggesting and recommending both in our communication tower guidelines and in our comments regarding proposed rulemaking in 2007 and more recently in comments in regard to this record that uh, where possible guy wire um, issues be avoided when there is an alternative monopole lattice or whatever okay I, I appreciate the correction because you're right I did I misspoke that um, you can create towers that tall with other means of support not just guy wires just a simple height cut off. It depends on things like wind conditions and soil conditions in the area as well. of the impacts and uh, according to NEPA significance is based on the context and intensity of the uh, of the impact and will be the basis for comparing the alternatives where we would look at we would compare the alternatives to the no action condition uh, that's already you know there's already towers in the environment now there's towers continuing to be built so the comparison is for the alternatives is looking at the uh, projecting into the future and then comparing that to the no action alternative. It's not looking at future conditions without any towers in the environment. That's not that's the not not the way the comparison is done. So we'll look at we'll compare the alternatives to the no action condition. I just wanted to make make that clear to everybody. And we're obviously going to be looking at adverse and beneficial impacts from from changes to the program. And once again the proposed action is a change to the program. So And that's uh, that's the point where we are now. We're taking you know taking a hard look at the uh, the impacts, uh, and then proceeding with uh, with the, with the development of the uh, PEA. Yeah, Bill. So I have a, a general comment that I, that I would like to make, and and that is that uh, first that um, the infrastructure coalition is pleased to participate in today's uh, scoping meeting. And we applaud the FCC for following through on its commitment uh, in the February 16th public notice to provide insight in the, into the methodology and the assumptions and the types of data that the FCC and URS are, are generating. Um, unfortunately, um, we were only able to ask questions today because we, we received the information today. And uh, so we haven't had an opportunity to, to really meaningfully digest it. And we think it deserves a lot of, 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 uh, of uh, of review and consideration and so um, it's our intention within the next few weeks uh, to submit some um, uh, written comments on on the subject absolutely and um, you know as was clear from parts of our presentation there are areas where there are gaps in in our knowledge now or in the things we've thought of and we appreciate the written comments um, I think within the next few weeks um, is a time frame that that should be aimed for um, you know as mentioned we're hoping to come out with the draft PEA in June and um, the closer it gets to that date the more difficult it will be for us to take things into consideration um, just one quick follow-up question uh, you said Jeffrey that there was the no action alternative and I just want to make clear when you say no action that the no action definition is on the FAA's not acting on the conspicuity study it's not based on the FCC not taking any action is that what I understand uh, sure uh, the no action is is basically the FCC continuing with the program as it is now no changes in the program under the MOU or under the MOU correct right since that's going to be you know implemented 
have a, a few qu just qu clarifying questions. Uh, Jeff, when you said that you uh, foresaw a trending down of towers, did you, did I understand you to mean a trending down of all towers or trending down of, of taller towers? Um, of, of, of towers that would be subject to antenna structure registration requirements. And uh, when you consider the alternatives, I would urge you to consider uh, ways in which the program could provide incentives for, for example, for co-location or for shorter towers. Uh, because I think that uh, some, uh, there could be opportunities for encouragement and not just either do we prohibit or do we uh, require an NEA because companies will do what f is in their economic interest and you could perhaps consider something like fast tracking uh, some towers or other ways to make it desirable. Uh, I would also like to ask whether you are considering at all uh, the categorical exclusion as it currently is and how it might change in the context of this uh, EEA or if whether that is only going to be considered in the context of rule changes. I mean, I think most, most of the kinds of changes that we're contemplating would take the form of changes to the categorical exclusion. That's the way we would likely implement them in our rules is um, greater number of circumstances in which an EA is required. Um, it would require a rulemaking action by the Commission. It would not be automatic upon issuance of the PEA. That's, um, you know, we're stuck with that as an administrative law matter. Oh, I wasn't suggesting that. I was just asking whether you were considering the ways in, in which these changes might take place in, in, as, as alternatives. Sure. Yes, sir. Well, just finally, um, on behalf of American Bird Conservancy, and I think on behalf of National Audubon Society and Defenders of Wildlife, we would like to add our appreciation to our colleagues from the Infrastructure Coalition and to the FCC um, and to URS for outlining the process. I think it's, uh, uh, it gives us a lot of information that we can take back and, and similarly uh, respond some written feedback in the next few weeks. But we appreciate the opportunity to hear about it uh, in person today. I join Darren in that. I also would like to just ask whether the PEA is going to consider uh, compliance under the ESA and the MBTA or whether you're only looking at NEPA. In, uh, so could you clarify that, please? Sure. Um, we are, um, you know, as part of the broad NEPA analysis, um, considering these other statutes on the on the ESA side. One of the things we were directed by the court, as well as um, doing the programmatic analysis, was to revisit um, the, the issue of consult, you know, programmatic consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service. We have spoken with Fish and Wildlife Service. We are still working through exactly how that is going to occur. But I think that. Yes, that issue will definitely be addressed. And did you uh, answer on MBTA? Um, you know, MBTA again. It's you know, it, it it's incorporated in the in the whole scope of the NEPA analysis. Um, you know, effects on migratory birds. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. And I would raise one other issue, and that is the Bold and Golden Eagle Protection Act that also needs to be included in here and then just put in a pitch and I know we've had this discussion before uh, an MOU between uh, FCC and the Fish and Wildlife Service under Executive Order 13186 so I I know mm -hmm. we know your position and feelings but uh, since we have another Commission signing an MOU we encourage you to as well consider that option which would I think help uh, move things forward in in related issues and concerns okay. thank you The one with FERC? Yes. It's being finalized. All right. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else to add? Anything else online? Okay. I think wrap it up then. Thanks, you know, to everyone for coming and for your 
active participation. I think you know we've learned a lot. We have a lot to take back. We we hope to, you know, as you're able to provide us with more specifics that we can work with, we welcome that. And um, just thanks everybody. <laughs>